In this episode, I'm discussing things of an adult nature. Please do not listen if you are under the age of 16. If you have young ones around you, pop on your headphones or download this episode and listen to it at another time. Hello everyone and welcome to the Law of Distraction podcast, unveiling spiritual truths in a distracted world. Tonight, I'm sharing the apocalyptic moment where God revealed his truth about my prideful ways and this sexual sin in my life. Biblically speaking, the term apocalypse means an unveiling or unfolding of things not previously known, nor which could have been known apart from the unveiling. And that is precisely what happened to me. When God opened my eyes to his truth, I couldn't unsee it. In the past, I've shared my thoughts, ideas and beliefs openly and earnestly as a way to relate and bring comfort to others who were stressed out from overthinking, mental mind blocks and confusion. And although those beliefs were more easily accepted to those around me at the time, I feel led still, and perhaps even more so now, to share my beliefs now that I know God. I mean, why wouldn't I? Well, because it's not popular. The world has been taught that Christians are by and large homophobic, ignorant, deluded, and Christianity's outdated principles, especially around God's sexual design for humanity, are repressive and unloving. At least that was my take. It's been hard for me to find the right words to share this part of my testimony with you, as I didn't want to cause further damage by saying the wrong things about the beautiful truth that I have found in Jesus. Seeing now through Holy Spirit goggles just how much biblical Christianity and Christians are misrepresented in the media, film, TV, music, It's understandable why most people shun seeking God. True biblical Christianity, that which has been taught to me by the Holy Spirit and is backed up by the Word of God, the divinely inspired scriptures that is the Bible, is one of truth and love. So in that spirit of truth and love, this is my story. A story of leaving pride. So let's begin at the beginning. And as far back as I can remember, I imagine around the time of school, the issue of confidence intrigued me. I was saddened to see others around me doubting themselves, scared to speak up and shying away from things in fear of being judged. I figured out very early on, I was lucky to be content with who I was. And I know a part of me urged this type of confident thinking in order to help others be happy with who they were. Does that make sense? Like, if they could see me carefree, happy to be me, it might give them permission to relax and accept just being themselves. I never thought I was better than anyone, but I didn't think I was less than either. I was all about equality. Now, we know more about this positive reinforcement and how it affects the subconscious, automatic mental and emotional thought process. In fact, I built an entire business around training people's brains to think positively about themselves, which wouldn't be possible without what I've come to see as the proof of God's design for free will, neuroplasticity, the ability to rethink our thinking. Yet, this process of positive self-affirmation, I would ultimately take too far in so much that I was blind to anything negative about myself and my actions Everything I did, I would somehow argue was right by dint of the choices I had made at the time and I thought were made in good conscience. I also had an aversion to saying sorry. At uni, people commented on my confidence. I had no worries about turning up to a party on my own or walking into a room full of people I didn't know. In fact, I loved being known as the outrageous one in the group, saying things that others didn't. I was brash, coarse, I'm the loudest person in the room, trying to outdo anyone on being the most explicit and the most sexual. It became a language all of its own, and a lens in which I interacted with the world. I was bored with small talk, and thought people were dull if they weren't on the same page as me in this manner. 
my artwork at university was an exploration of sexual statements, fetishism, gender, and live performances reflecting and combating female archetypes. I felt knowledgeable. To earn some cash during university, I worked at a popular gay nightclub and enjoyed the flirty, open, sexualized atmosphere. I and everyone around me was well aware of my attraction to everyone. Appreciating men and women as sexual beings, and if they couldn't see their beauty or sexiness, I'd be happy to point it out. This was the natural extension to building up my own self and doing that for others too. This was definitely intertwined with my ongoing ideology that everyone had worth, which I still believe, and that everyone is good deep down, which I no longer believe. Cinderella was my favourite story growing up. I felt that the prince would have loved her no matter what. He was intrigued by her, and I was intrigued by her. I wanted to be her, and I also wanted to play the role of the prince. Well aware of women's beauty and charm, it was totally natural and obvious to me that both sexes were sexy. I thought anyone who couldn't see that were either kidding themselves and hadn't opened themselves up sexually, or, and this is where you can see my pride on full display, that they would eventually catch up to my obviously correct way of thinking. I guess I must have thought of it like I was sexually evolved. I couldn't think another way. And if anyone had said to me back then that I was wrong, I would have dismissed them as uninvolved. But nobody challenged me on my thinking. Perhaps nobody really knew. Perhaps being told at 16 I couldn't have children allowed me to accept those desires for both men and women more readily as the total truth of my sexuality. What was natural to me and my body must be the natural order of things. But I think I had already seamlessly fused together what seemed obvious to me. All people are desirable, and so my desire for all people is right. Not having the option to have children may have given me a subconscious green light to pursue a sexual adventure like some dreamed-up Parisian artist, a desperately beautiful, melancholic tale of love and life. I was, and still am, very taken with romance. My identity was now woven into this sexual persona and character. I led with my sexuality. It was a big part of me. It was me. It was how I spoke and what I did and how I acted. My identity was steeped in my overt sexuality and everything was framed by it. With the idea of marriage far from my mind, as a self-confessed commitment phobe, the thought of being stuck with one person held no appeal. And that's how I imagined it, like being stuck. I felt like I wasn't designed for monogamy. It didn't feel right. I prided myself on being some sort of one-woman sexual connoisseur. And I was on a mission for freedom. No rules, no boundaries, creating a world where everything was permissible. Toying with the idea at one point of becoming a sex worker. Using sex as a sort of therapy. And not for one second did I stop and think, is this in any way harmful to my spirit or to a future relationship I may one day want? It felt right. I was in control. And anyone I spoke to about it applauded me and my emancipated ways. Pride had truly set in. I was living the life as a pioneer of self-love and what could be wrong with that? I wasn't harming anyone. It's interesting to me now to see so many millions of people posting about self-care Sundays, self-love affirmations, self-first, self-self selfies. I too was teaching how it wasn't selfish to put your desires first. It was loving yourself so that you could be healed and then have the capacity to love and help others. I can understand why the idea of submitting to a higher power might feel like restricting, why being told by an unseen God what to do and how that goes against what feels good in the moment. Yet without God, we don't know what is good. The struggle can be seen universally across all nations and cultures between parents and children, the parent trying to discipline their headstrong child, warning them of unseen dangers and trying to teach them goodness. This is the picture of God and his children. 
how before we don't hear the love in his commands. It sounds like nagging, but once we are in him, we can know his perfect love and moral perfection. In 2014, I was asked to organise and host the newly formed cabaret stage at my local Pride. Even got to name it. It was the first year a gay Pride parade was seen in my city. Flattered to be asked, I jumped at the chance. I'd been putting on monthly fun life drawing classes using burlesque stars as our models, so I had plenty of contacts and experience on putting on a show. The first year I organised the theme, the performers, decorations and music and introduced the acts and delighted in revving up the crowd with my usual bawdy banter. I didn't take part in the march through the city. For one, I was too busy setting up and remembered not being that bothered. I genuinely thought it wasn't needed in many ways. I was there to celebrate love in all of its colours. I couldn't imagine that there was still a need to publicly and politically take a stand for sexual orientation and gay liberties. I genuinely thought that battle was done. That is how I lived my life with no comeback. I am now so painfully aware of the bubble in which I lived. The second year I did walk in the march. I was shocked to see people protesting with ballads and placards on one church corner saying stuff about hell and Jesus. I remember turning to my friend and saying, What on earth? And she said, yeah, they're they're always protesting. I was truly shocked. I had naively discounted any idea that there would be anyone protesting what seemed so obvious to me, love and accept everyone as they are. I uncomfortably laughed it off thinking that in time this kind of thinking would eventually die off and that all of humanity would catch up to my enlightened way of thinking and that of my friends. In the following years, me and my beloved co-host planned the shows, each year getting bigger as the crowd got larger. We tried to outdo ourselves each year, bigger, bolder, louder, prouder. When the 2018 Pride rolled around, I had built up my business to such a level I had less to do with organising Pride and the show. Backstage, some of the performers shared about their depression, suffering loss and other heaviness from their life. My compulsion was to try and fix them, to say something helpful, to offer up some wisdom. As someone who was signed up to the reality that was solely based on vibrational frequency and the thoughts becoming things, I tried to help them navigate out of their negative thinking patterns. Something was stirring in me, which would make sense in due course, a feeling that there was more to learn. If I could just level up in my spiritual practices, that little bit more, if I could spend time, more time, tapping into my infinite wisdom, I would have an answer, believing that the answers were within. Little did I know or ever expect that path to lead me to the cross. Members of the audience gushed forward after the festivities to join in the whooping and the hollering, but I couldn't connect as much as I had in previous years. I remember one person in particular pulling me aside and said, I've been planning on killing myself this year. I've been in a very dark place, but the only thing that I had to look forward to is pride and seeing you get drunk on stage, Heather, and make me laugh. That's been really the one thing that's been keeping me going. I was crushed to hear this and what they'd been going through. I'd urge them to get in touch the following week and that I'd be happy to sit and chat with them or point them to someone that could help. I was so sad to hear this, obviously, and said they must reach out and we'll talk and maybe I could help. But inside I was feeling drained with my life, with my work, hollowed out with very little to offer. That was the August and little did I know that only two months later I would be falling to my knees, sobbing in front of a God that I never knew existed. To say I was an atheist would be wrong. I had dismissed the idea of God so much, I wouldn't even call myself an atheist. And not in an angry way, in a subconscious hating God way. I didn't acknowledge that there was even a God to be against. There are so many aspects to my testimony of breaking free from the deceptions of energy work, law of attraction, manifestation, and how God drew me home. 
The spiritual dowsing I'd been doing had led me to this point where I had paid another experienced dowser to clear my home. And what he found in his words was a negative flow of energy in my home and gardens, which he corrected, and an entity that had attached itself to me. An entity? But I didn't believe in entities. The unseen realm was simply energy. I don't know why I thought that way, having read and absorbed so much of the Abraham Hicks books, who channel their books and teachings using Esther Hicks as a mouthpiece. I'd also recently booked sessions with a channeler who allowed what she believed to be the archangel Metatron to take hold of her body and speak through her. So, apparently the unseen has a voice. Side note, I can see the hypocrisy. People refusing to acknowledge God People will say that the Bible is written by man and therefore cannot be trusted, which helps with the intrinsic case that man is sinful, yet will refute the work of the Holy Spirit and that all scripture is God-breathed, yet happy to believe like I did, channeled readings, books and teachings. It's nonsensical and hypocritical. The night I met God was late October 2018. Late in the night, I felt an eeriness that I just couldn't shake. My beautifully appointed bedroom with matching pink 60s lampshades with its usual warm glow had taken on a hazy darkness. All this talk of spiritual entities that had plagued my mind for weeks as I began to question my beliefs on the unseen. That night, I felt a presence, a looming darkness encroaching on my space. No other words for it. I felt spooked. Something powerful was taunting me. It was more than just my mind. This was spiritual. For an hour or so, I battled against this feeling, thinking oh, I must be daft, trying every way to dismiss this idea and shake off this looming presence. Agitated, I moved from room to room, unable to sleep. No way was I going to turn off the lights. Things got to a point where I said, enough, and I headed back into my bedroom. As I entered, everything in the room looked evil. I know that's a crazy thing to say, but it was like I could perceive beyond physical sight this smear of darkness that now polluted every inch of my room. A terror came over me that I had never known or experienced before. This was the moment I called out to Jesus. For the first time in my life, I was directing a plea to him with no expectation that I would receive an answer. The mist lifted. A brilliance came into my room. A clarity and a calmness in my heart and a peace surrounded me. What was going on? Was this real? Am I hallucinating? Do I need my eyes checked? Yet I knew I knew something profound and monumental had just taken place. I had no previous knowledge of Jesus. I just thought he was some cool, good-looking dude who wrote the Bible and told some great stories that people have been fighting over. I had a lot to learn and fast. Without knowing the biblical terms, what sin meant, who God was, and how Jesus fitted into the picture, my spirit cracked and broke open as I choked and coughed on tears barely able to breathe full of love for this God that had revealed himself to me. It's the only way I can describe it, feeling of being made whole. It was only later that I would read about repentance, being born again and baptised by the Holy Spirit. But that night, Jesus had led me through it all. He was so gentle with me in opening my eyes and my heart to my sinful ways. He showed me my pride he showed me my sexual sins. Looking at myself and my life from a perspective I would never be able to understand if I had not had this encounter. I could see how watching pornography, masturbating, having sex with others outside of marriage was harmful not only to my sexual psyche, but to my relationship with God. I tore down the mini shrine of erotic images on my bedroom wall, threw out books of nudes and books on sex, erotic novels that I was once so proud of. I sobbed not only for my pride and sexual sins, but other stuff too. I was no longer pansexual, bisexual, 
divine energy, goddess, boss babe, energy healer, entrepreneur, but a child of God. That was my identity. God sees me as more. I am more than just my sexual self, and it felt like relief. Like I'd grown a new arm or something, a new dimension of me had opened up. I had passed from death to life, a new creation in Christ. God had restored me, redeemed me, and forgiven me. I was feeling a lot of things all at once, mortified by my sin, joy at knowing the love of my Creator, fear of God in His almightiness, and relief of finally knowing who I truly am. My mind rocketed back to that stage at Pride, at that suicidal soul who looked so lost. I could understand with this new clarity the horror of reality of this broken world, and at the same time the greatness of God I considered for the first time that the struggle that so many LGBTQ go through might just simply come from social stigma. But maybe something spiritual is going on. A community that is three times more likely to contemplate suicide and five times more likely to attempt suicide than a person identifying as heterosexual. My heart breaks. Even as the world now, in 2020, is more likely to celebrate their LGBTQ friends and relatable stories are told through film and TV, the statistics aren't reflecting this open acceptance. We live in a fallen world. Meaning, despite being God's creation, it is spiritually broken. When sin entered this world, the relationship with God was broken. Because he is so holy, such pure love, he cannot be connected with anything sinful. Sin meaning literally to miss the mark, to miss God's plan for your life. He cannot be connected with anything sinful, and praise God for that. Who wants a God who bends the rules? A great moral giver that's changeable to the whims of man. But he never left us. He made a way, and that way is Jesus. God himself entered into his own creation to pay for the sins we have committed against him. All we need to do to restore this beautiful relationship is to awaken to our fallen nature, acknowledge that we have sinned, and ask for his forgiveness. And yes, I went through lots of possible explanations over that weekend. Was I losing my mind? Was I in a midlife crisis? Was this some sort of brain trickery or optical illusion? Or, or is biblical Christianity real? That there is a God, and this is actually happening? I had prided myself in being so open-minded, I could hardly now reject the idea that this was a possible option. I'd either be a hypocrite, or my so-called open-mindedness was a sham all along. It was checkmate, and God was victorious. And as I would come to later read in scripture, that's kind of his jam. He was victorious on the cross, and he will be victorious again at the end of days. The way in which he brings about this victory is usually at the surprise to the human mind. So many biblical accounts showing this to be true. He helped me understand his infinite genius, intelligence, and the most gentle kind of love I have ever known or ever will. I knew I needed to start reading the Bible and fast. I remember how much of a struggle it was that weekend to even get out of bed, my mind a world with this new idea. It felt like I'd crawled to the library to take out this Bible. Now, I was never one for skimping on buying anything, but getting hold of a Bible felt like the hardest thing ever. My awareness of a very real spiritual battle was becoming evident. Finally, I was holding the Word of God in my hand. This dusty old book that I had dismissed, I was now in awe of. The words like rain to my torched soul, living water. The word coming alive before my eyes. God had given me his spirit and was showing me so much. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. Lean not on your own understanding. Seek his will in all that you do and he will show you the path to take. 
The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the will of God. Whoa, this whole time, ideas on life were coming from me. I had made up a religion of one and I was the God of it. Thoughts on self and sex and relationships had come from me, from my limited perspective, blinded by pride, from my heart that yearned for accolades and constant praise. More truths were jumping off the pages of scripture. Yet the heart is deceitful above all things who can know it. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. God giving me new desires of my heart, having been spiritually reborn and the strength in which to follow them. To obey his commands is the only logical, intelligent thing to do. Yet he knows we will fail. He knows I will fail. And yet he promises to always make a way. Never giving us too much temptation that we cannot bear it, but allows us to live set free from the chains of sin, shaping us to walk this life more Christ-like. Yes, for his glory, and yet in his excellence, it is for our current and eternal benefit. He is genius, and I am all about it. Decades of following my heart had led me to a dark, empty place. My attempts for sexual happiness were short-lived. Like any addict, I would find myself chasing an impossible high. Not so was Jesus. The wholeness, the peace that passes all understanding, transcended my earthly understanding of satisfaction. Marriage made sense to me now. It is the only way in which a relationship could ever work. Sex is a sacred gift from God, and a new longing to be a wife to someone started to seed in my heart. This would truly shock anyone who knew me before. Hungry to read more of the Bible, God's everlasting word, it feels so personal. I couldn't stop muttering at the time in total astonishment. We're living in biblical times and we've not changed in all of this time. So what did that mean for my life? What did that mean for my sexual self? I didn't know, but I wasn't scared. My control freak nature had turned into faith in God. He has a plan and I knew it would be the greatest decision of my life to put my trust in him, to follow Jesus. To my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I wanted to say a few words about when you're sharing the gospel of Jesus to your LGBTQ plus friends. I would urge you not to use the term lifestyle, engaging in this lifestyle. It shows a misunderstanding of sexuality and identity and how they can feel like one and the same thing. By rejecting a person's claim to a particular sexual orientation, it will feel like you're rejecting them and no doubt feel like a personal attack. And I believe it's one of the reasons why it's so heavily defended. Saying simplistically that God finds homosexuality an abomination, the LGBTQ person will hear God finds me an abomination. God is against me, and we know that's not truth. We need to share truth in love. We need to share that that identity actually transcends sexuality. Firstly, it's not what we do that ingratiates us to God. It's who we are in relation to him. We are either a child of wrath or a child of God, either born again or dead in our trespasses. No one is good enough or doing enough good things to merit heaven and eternal life but God. God has placed eternity in our hearts and knowledge that there is something more. We are something more. As spirit-filled followers of Jesus, we are commanded to share the good news to all. And part of your armour from God are the shoes. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. These shoes need to be a comfortable fit. So get to know your Bible, get to know human behaviours and know the key questions. Have you ever tried walking a few steps in shoes that don't quite fit? painful and you look foolish. Be ready to go anywhere and everywhere. Don't shy away from these conversations, yet if you don't feel equipped right now to answer questions on this subject, don't. Be prayerful and quick about your learning and immerse yourself, ask questions and do research. This sexual identity, sexual orientation and gender orientation conversation needs to be had. We need to be salt and light. And how shall they preach except they be sent? 
as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Romans 10, 15. This passage is so beautiful to me. Messengers sharing the good news. They would have walked and ran and travelled across miles and miles of stony, dusty, dirty ground. Their feet battered and bloody in order to save the lost. That's the beauty of the gospel message. Jesus cared enough to shed his blood for us. Pray for wisdom. Pray for the words and the opportunities. Ask questions. Listen to the answers. What do they know about God? Have they thought about what Christians believe? And do they know what sin means biblically? If the conversation feels heated, back out. There is more likely to be opportunities again further down the line. Remember, we're leading people to Christ. Be wise, be loving. Getting to know God is an incredibly personal thing. It is the work of the Holy Spirit that will pierce someone's conscience But it is such a credible blessing to obey God's leading in someone's salvation, being in prayer for them and leading them to the Lord. It's not God versus homosexuality. It's God against all sin. All types of sex outside a marriage between a biological male and a biological female is sin. The unregenerated mind fights against it. Sex is a spiritual activity as much as a physical, emotional and sensual one. Our culture has largely rejected the spiritual aspect of sex and I believe this is due to unbelief and that there is another way, a better way. I've travelled down those roads of spiritual sex, tantra and ecstatic love. It's hollow, draining and ultimately unloving. Remember, it's not a five minute conversation to have with someone. Get to know those around you and understand their understanding of sin and God and who Jesus is so you can point them to truth. We all deal with sin, we all fall short, we all miss God's mark, but we are empowered by his word and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, dear listener, for hearing my testimony. Please feel free to contact me on Instagram at The Law of Distraction. I'm always interested in hearing your thoughts, comments or feedback. And as ever, I invite you to question in your life. Am I going to choose my way or Yahweh?